and thank you for coming to our Google Water Seminar. My name is Adam Seiler. I am a loan originator with Advisors Mortgage Group, and I'm also your neighbor. I live right down the road in Lacey. <laughs> um, one of the biggest reasons why we all got together is because we're all local professionals in the area. We all live in the area, so we all try to do work where we live. Um, one of the first questions I always ask is, have you ever bought a house in the past? Anybody? No? Okay, so you've got some first time home buyers. Awesome. Even if you bought a house in the past, if you haven't bought a house in the last three years or have not had any ownership in the last three years, you're still technically a first time home buyer. You get to qualify for owning programs. Um, homes are one of the greatest investments you can make in your life. What do you know that you can buy that increases in value over time that you can actually use? Can you do that with your car? No, it loses value. Your home always increases in value. You can deduct expenses from your house, like mortgage insurance. You can deduct some of the tax expense off of your yearly taxes, and you get that money back. So it's, it's a great thing. Usually, most of the people that I know that you would consider wealthy, the majority of them built their wealth through real estate. By owning real estate and by selling, converting, it's a great way to build wealth as opposed to just a retirement account, which hopefully grows, hopefully doesn't. There's only so much real estate that's definitely going to grow. You're not building anymore. <laughs> One of the things that I always tell people when I meet them, I really genuinely think anybody can buy a house. It's plain and simple. Anyone can buy a house. Why do I say that? Face <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> one, one of the main things to buying a house is having a plan. You need persistence, right? So whether you can buy a house today or you can buy a house six months from now, a year from now. All you really need is a plan. That's it, it's really that simple. If you can't qualify today, no big deal. Doesn't mean that if you don't, we don't set up a plan and put you on the right track, that six months from today, you won't be able to buy a house. You will be able to buy a house if that's what you want to do. You just have to make sure that you follow the plan. So, one of the things that we always ask for is time frame that you're looking at. So, what are next six months, next year soon? Um, and that kind of helps us to be able to develop a plan for you. Because there are things that we can do to speed up the process, but that's all about what your time frame is and what you're looking to do. So, you need three things to qualify for a mortgage. You need the ability to pay. So that is how much money you make. You cannot buy a million dollar house if you only make $20,000 a year. It's just a matter of plain and simple. So you have to be able to physically make the payments on the house. No bank will lend you money and put you in a situation that you cannot afford. It's just, it's completely illegal. The second thing is your willingness to pay. So that's basically just the history of your credit report and your FICO. It shows how you paid your debts in the past and how responsible you've been with your debt. And the third thing is the loan to value of the property. So that's, that's just a great way to say how much money you're going to put down. Depending on how much money you put down will help fit you into a specific program because they all have different guidelines and requirements. We're going to talk about the four basic types of mortgages today. FHA, conventional, VA, and USDA. Those are the four most common mortgages that I see on a regular basis. Conventional. That is simply the most common type of mortgage. Um, I'm sure most of you have probably heard your 30-year fixed 
fixed rate mortgage with 20% down. That is the most common mortgage out there. They adhere to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines. Those are the two government agencies that kind of regulate that. Uh, the down payment is actually as little as 3%. That's a trick, folks. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> but uh, for first time home buyers, the down payment is actually as little as 3%. And you will always have mortgage insurance for anything less than 20% down. Payment. FHA and VA. So, uh, <laughs> Mortgage insurance? Can you wrap that into the back? Is there a way to finagle that so that they don't have to pay that extra? Upfront? So, there are a lot of different ways to do that. Either you can make a one time payment on the front end, along with your closing costs, or you can pay a higher interest rate to be able to wrap that into the mortgage and you not have to. So there, there are definitely ways around the mortgage insurance. No worries. Um, so FHA and VA are government loans. They're a little bit different than the conventional. Um, they typically have stricter requirements for the house itself, as in uh, railings, no peeling paint, no major repairs. The house has to be loaded. So anything with government loans, it's really set up around the buyer. The government really wants to protect the people that are getting into the houses and make sure that they are not buying something that they cannot physically live in. The sellers can pay up to 6% of the buyer's closing costs. So that's a big thing with government loans. Um, typically on conventional loans, it wasn't mentioned, if you're putting less than 10% down, the maximum seller contribution is only 3%. So on government loans, it's double that, it's 6%, which is really cool because if you're buying a house and the seller can help you with the closing costs, that's a very positive thing. The credit qualifications are way more flexible on government loans. The ratios for the income are a lot better, you can go a lot higher. They're more okay with certain late payments. They're backed by the government, and the way they're backed by the government is you're going to pay an upfront funding fee. On any government loan, you will pay an upfront funding fee. On FHA, it happens to be 1.75% of the loan amount. You don't physically have to pay that at the closing table upfront. It just gets added on to the loan, and instead of taking, let's say, a $200,000 loan, you would just add the 1.75% on it, and that would be they're 3.5% down. That is the lowest you can go on FHA. And they also have mortgage insurance. On government loans, except for VA, they will have mortgage insurance and it does not go away. Conventional loans, you do pay mortgage insurance for anything less than 20%. Eventually it goes away. Government loans, it doesn't go away. The only way it goes away is if you refinance into a conventional loan. VA, one last note. If you are a veteran or are related to a veteran and they're buying the house with you, you can do 0% down, which is really cool. The rates are usually a little bit lower than anything else. There is a funding fee for government loan, but there is no mortgage insurance. USDA loan. So there's a reason why this slide is all by itself, because USDA is an animal all by itself. It's a wonderful program, but the guidelines are very, very strict, and they're very limited. So if you qualify for it, it's great to have, but it's very limited. They do 100% financing. There is no money down. I believe the funding fee is 2% on USDA. I can double check that for you. Off the top of my head, I want to say it's 2%. There's a limit on the area it's in. So USDA is specifically focused on building up areas. USDA, you might have heard from like farmers, milk, cows, 
So it's it's for rural development. That's specifically what it's for. So any town that has a population of less than 35,000, I believe, qualifies for USDA. So you can't lose a USDA loan to buy a house in Thomas River. It's not going to work. But like now, and I have a listing that yes. qualifies for USDA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now, once you come, uh, especially around in this area, once you get to about Lenoka Harbor and south and west, you're usually okay for USDA. We can always check the specific location; not a big deal. But um, but you have to watch the population amounts in the town. They also do have a limit on income. USDA, you count the income of the household. It's not just the borrower. So if you're just the borrower, you have great credit, you have $80,000 of income, and you find this house, but then you have your wife who's not on the mortgage who makes another $80,000, can't do it. Too much money. So they have specific caps on income, and it's dependent on family size. Government loan also has a 6% seller contribution. So this is just a simple map of the home buying process. It looks overwhelming, but it's really not that crazy. So one of the first things that you really want to do is speak to somebody about getting a free approval, getting a look at your credit, kind of seeing where your budget is, what you can afford, and then taking it from there. From there, you're going to meet with the broker. Your realtor is going to be a lifesaver whether you realize it or not. I have deals going through without realtors, and it is extremely difficult to try to get a hold of people who work, have jobs, have lives. This is not what they do. They don't know where to get documents, how to schedule things, what to schedule. It's very difficult. A realtor will do all that work for you. That is what they get paid to do. Paid by the seller. The buyers don't pay the agent. Always, 100%. As a buyer, there's no way that I can see why you wouldn't use a realtor. You never pay for the realtor. The sellers always pay. So that other stuff... Uh, Kim will talk about some of it, John will talk about some of it, and then I can answer some questions at the end if you have any. Yes, you use a realtor. <laughs> Just repeating what I said, you use a realtor. I can't stress it enough, you absolutely 100% want to use a realtor. And if you know a great realtor, that's who you want to use. Go ahead, I'll sit down. Yeah, oh yeah, this is you. Okay, I'm up. All right, so um, I think we're going to talk about each of these on each slide. You want to start going? There I am. So um, as your agent, I am going to educate you about the market. We'll talk about um, prices. We'll go over interest rates. We're going to sit down. We're going to you know, see how many bedrooms you need, see how many baths you need, um, square footage. I will then go home, I will pull up houses that match your criteria, everything's electronic now, I send you an email, you look at them, and then you say, Kim, can you schedule a showing for this house on this time? And that's what I do. Um, and uh, I also help coordinate the uh, other professionals. Usually as soon as I get a buyer and they're interested on the house, I call John, I text John, the home inspector, and say, you know, it's 1,300 square feet, Four bedrooms, two baths, you know, what would you charge? And then, so we're constantly talking, I'm constantly talking to Adam, too, about financing. Um, if you need a new roof, I'm getting an estimate for the new roof. Uh, you know, if you need air conditioning fix, whatever it is, I'm, I'm usually in the middle trying to get everybody coordinated. Um, also, you put an offer in on a house. Then I am the one who is negotiating with the other agent. You're not talking to the seller. You're not talking to the other agent. I'm the one that's back and forth, and I'm putting forth our case. So if it needs a new roof, and they're asking tons of money for the house, and we're going in at 30 grand below, I'm going to say, we're offering this, and then I'm going to justify 
why we are offering that and lay out all the things that are wrong with the house um, to help support our case. And then I solve problems. So I try to make the process as easy for you as the buyer. Um, and if problems arise, I always keep my clients in the loop. I, I sometimes, I mean, I'm constantly, I, I'm, I'm always back and forth with my clients. Every little thing you will know about, but I will come with a solution and say, how about we do this? How about we do this? Um, so that's pretty much what I do. Um, we kind of talked about this. The first thing you're going to do is get pre-approval. To run around without a pre-approval, I've done it. There's clients who want to do it. I do it. But it never fails. By the time they get pre-approved, the house that they want is gone. And then they're all upset. And now we're starting all over again. So um, it's very, very important to get the pre-approval. Plus, you know, Adam may say you can afford a $100,000 house. But in your head, you're like, oh, I can afford a $200,000 house. So if we're looking at all of these other houses that you can't even, you're, we're not even going to be able to purchase. So it's so important. Mm -hmm. Yes. If we are only able to get a hundred thousand dollar house, yes. Will you stick by us to help improve our credit to get us to be able? Of course. To to we we just worked with someone who was uh, pre-approved for eighty, ninety, something like that, eighty or ninety, and he stuck with her for six months to get her pre-approved. So the price does not matter. It really doesn't. All three of us, we love what we do. Um, it, it's so rewarding for all of us to just see someone purchase a, a home and start a family or, or bring their family in. Um, home ownership is the American dream, you know, and it's the biggest purchase you'll ever make in your life. So we don't care if it's a $50,000 house or if it's a $500,000 house. We will stick by you through the whole thing. Okay? Uh, okay. So we already talked about this. Based on the amount of slides that we have about get pre-approved, so that's, pre that's really like, <laughs> it's that important. That yeah. is one of the biggest steps that you can make in the process. Okay, down payment. Adam talked a little bit about that. Um, my whole thing about once you're pre-approved and we're looking, please don't go buy a car. Please don't, you know, run up the credit card because you can be pre-approved and then the next day you can be unpre-approved <laughs> because you're they're going to run your credit and run everything the day of closing. So we could be at the closing table and you went and bought a car the day before and guess what? You're not going to be right. So that's what I'll say about down payment and pre-approval and all that. And not only the day, usually it's one or two days before closing, and it's also one or two days after. So if you... Oh, I didn't do that. 100%. Oh. So if you get out of closing, and then you're like, oh, yeah, I closed out my house, <laughs> and then you run to the car dealership and buy a car an hour later, the next day, when they rerun again, they're going to recall on your house. 100%. It's the worst possible so just wait a couple days the world. <laughs> Basically, you don't want to change what you normally do. Oh, that's what I just talked about. Yes, maintaining your pre-approval. Okay, finding your home. This is the fun part. I love, I love, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so I have a paper that we'll sit down and we'll fill out about needs and wants. So... Um, you may want a pool, but is it mandatory? You have to have the pool because, well, if not, we're going to put that in once. So the needs is what I'm first going to look at, and then it'll be the wants. I'm working with a couple right now who they needed a screened in back porch. So I knew it was a need. I was only going to show them houses with screened in back porches. And there's actually a lot of them out there. Um, so that's very, very important. And I don't want to ha um, run you guys around to 50 houses when 20 of them you're not going to like. So it's very important that you communicate with me exactly what you want. And that way I don't waste your time running around like crazy. Okay. 
So, when we go into a house, we're going to look at the space, the layout, um, how, how close it is to schools, your jobs. What am I going to be looking at? I'm going to be walking through and I'm looking at the ceiling. Is there any leaks? Are there cracks? We, I just, the same couple that I was showing, um, they were looking at Holiday City and every, the same model had the cracks in the same exact places throughout the house. So I did a little bit of research and found out there's actually a lawsuit against the builder because all of this um, one type of housing, the structure's not good. And they love this model, but it was like, do you really want to risk it? So that's what I'm looking for. Um, and I'm also looking, you know, if they start talking about, oh, well, you know, I want to knock down this wall and redo the kitchen, in my mind I'm thinking, okay, well, if you do that, will you make that up when you sell it five or ten years down the road? Because sometimes a three-bedroom, two-bath is only going to be worth this much to this much. So you can put another $100,000 in the house and you will not make it back. So that's what I'm thinking about. Uh, I'm looking at the roof. I'm looking at, you know, the air conditioning. Uh, but the home inspector will do it a lot better. But I'm just doing it right off the bat. And then you're going to say, Kim, I want to put an offer in. And then we're going to talk. Um, I'll go run comps in the area. We're going to talk. We're going to say, you know, well, what do you, you know, how much do you want to offer? You, you can always negotiate um, unless it's a, a house that you absolutely love, 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 and do not want to lose it. I, um, you know, very rarely do I say offer the asking price. A lot of times sellers are always, you know, you shoot high and then uh, you negotiate them. Um, and again, but you have to have reasons. So I, that's what I'm there for. We're, we're looking at the different things so that I can explain it. Um, contingencies. Uh, seller concession. You can ask for the sellers to help with the closing costs. We do that a lot. Uh, contingencies, uh, you know, I want the washer. The washer's not listed. Well, we're going to ask for the washer and the dryer. So things like that. And it's also the house if you have to sell it. Inspections and repairs. All right, John, you're up. So again, my name is John Barossi. I'm a New Jersey license home inspector with JP Home Inspections. I am a uh, certified commercial and residential mold inspector and also a certified residential thermographer. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born and raised right here in uh, right Lacey Township. Graduated uh, Lacey Township High School. Uh, got my doctorate degree from King University. And I bought my first and only home right in Fourth River. And I have a daughter, she's not 22 months, she's two years old now, which is uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> so, are you guys familiar with the home inspection process at all? I mean, so what, what's inspected? So we're going to be looking at the structural components, exteriors, roofing systems, plumbing systems, electrical, heating, cooling, interior components, insulation components and ventilation, fireplaces and solid fuel burning appliances. So we're looking at pretty much everything from top to bottom. So, should you be present for the home inspection? Absolutely. I encourage it. Um, I know a lot of people that have the inspection and they, you know, the inspector says, let me do my thing, and they kind of just do it alone. Um, I feel that if you're with the inspector and it's an interactive inspection, you, know, you may have questions right there. I can answer them. Um, and you just think, hey, this is going to be your house. I want to make sure that you guys have the best understanding of the house that you're buying. So a lot of people will come to me at the end of the inspection and say, did it pass or did it fail? So a home inspection is not a pass or fail inspection. It's, you know, you are purchasing a home, and that home has a story to tell. And I'm there to simply put it on a report. Um, you know, there's going to be things that may need to be repaired or replaced, and then there's going to be other useful information in the report, like where the main water shutoff is, where the main gas shutoff is, the electrical shutoff is, just in case there's a problem. You will already know where that is. So, the home inspection report. So, the report is a type of report of photos, so it's very easy to read and understand. Um, it's typically completed within 24 to 48 hours of the inspection. And um, what I do 
is, again, this is going to be one of your biggest investment purchases. So I like to have a one-on-one -on -one phone um, inter uh, interview, really, uh, meeting. So you can have the report, I'll have the report open, and we can go over the report page by page if we need to make sure that you fully understand that report. And um, I wanted to make mention, too, because Kim had said that she's you know, in the background getting, you know, the, the roof needs to be replaced or repaired. She's doing all these estimates. A home inspection, we don't provide any type of estimate for repair or replacements. So um, so that's really a really good thing that Kim does because once you get the report done, you're, you're in a contract. And that contract has a deadline to get you know people out there to evaluate the roof, to get repairs, you know, so you can get estimates for the roof. So if you already have that going in to into the process, that's gonna expedite things and make things so much easier. Um, and what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, is infrared. It's a thermal imaging camera, and I have a little uh, demonstration to show you here. So this camera here, it detects surface temperatures, and it displays it in an image, okay? And we can get a lot, a lot of useful information with this camera. Now, a couple of the things that we can get information from is... One, if there's any missing insulation between the walls. Okay. We can also determine if there are potential water issues or overheating electrical. So again, this camera here, like I said, displays surface temperature. So my hand right now is warm, so it comes up as an orange red color. Okay. Anything colder is going to come up like a blue or a purple. So, for example, I have this piece of drywall here. It's a painted piece of drywall, and this is, you know, to simulate either under a window or by a door. Now, is there, are there any signs that this drywall is wet? And if there are, can you point it out to me if you can see that it's wet? All right. So this camera, because once moisture hits drywall or, or another surface, it becomes much colder than the surrounding surface. So when I'm doing the house, I'm doing a scan of the house, and uh, you see that dark purple spot right there? I don't know if you guys can see that. So that's a thermal anomaly. So now I know something's going on right there. And to me, because I am certified and trained in it, that to me looks like moisture. And then I have a moisture meter. And I will check to see, first of all, what the unaffected area is. And then as I go to that cold spot, let's see, it's telling me that that's wet. Okay? But visibly, we cannot see that this is wet. So now I know if this is under a window, we know that window's leaking. So this is a really great tool to help if there are any hidden moisture problems. Now, one of the other major things that this can do is it can identify overheating electrical. So I have here, I've simulated two receptacles, okay? Just by the looks of it, can you tell me if one may be overheating or looks warmer than the other? So when you have loose connections, that's actually going to cause overheating. So what I do, as I'm scanning the house, you can see that this box is clearly overheated. So that's a potential fire hazard waiting to happen. I put hand warmers in here. So this is that's how sensitive this camera is. You know, I want to do hand warmers in there, and that shows me that there's something going on in there. So this this camera is a very unique tool. Um, a lot of home inspectors either don't have it or they charge extra for it. Okay, that's included with every single inspection. Um, you know, I find something out of the ten home inspections I do, probably seven houses I will find at least something with that camera. <laughs> so some helpful tips: a uh, home inspection should take approximately two and a half to three hours. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, depending on how the inspection goes, the size of the house, etc. Um, make sure your realtor coordinates to have all the utilities on at the time of the inspection. It's also important that access to the added crawl space, utilities, electrical panels, etc., are readily available. Now, as a home inspector, you know we're not going to be moving furniture out of the way. Um, you know, a lot of times people will uh, have a second car that's parked in the garage. Well, a lot of times the attic entrance is in the garage, the electrical panels in the garage. And if I can't get access to those, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to, you know, either reschedule or re, or re inspection, and that usually comes with a fee. So if we make
make sure that we have access to all of those areas prior to the inspection, make sure that all the utilities are on. You know, we have, uh, we're by the shore, so there's a lot of houses that are summer homes, and what they typically do is they'll shut off the water and shut off the electric sometimes. Now, I can't, going into a house, I don't know why the water shut off. I don't know why, you know, a breaker is off. It may be off for a good reason. Now, I'm not going to just go on and start turning on breakers and water valves because there may be a leak that they're aware of that I'm not. So to avoid potential damage, we don't operate any um, electrical uh, breakers or shut off valves. Um, so again, follow your inspector and ask questions. This is going to be your house. So I want to make sure that you guys truly understand what's going on with the house. And um, read the pre-inspection agreement. Uh, it's very, very important to understand what's inspected and what's not inspected. For an example, I don't inspect pools, okay? I feel that if the house has a pool, and let's say I do inspect it, but again, home inspectors, we don't write repairs or repair estimates. So let's say I do find something with the, with the pool. Okay, so now you obviously know something's wrong with the pool. You're gonna still have to get a pool expert out there, hire them to do an inspection, and then give you an estimate so then Kim can help negotiate those repairs. So some of the things that are outside the scope of home inspection, it just makes sense to hire the expert initially. Um, again, even with septic, we were talking about this, uh, underground septic lines or, or septic uh, systems, we don't inspect. Um, so it's very important to go over the inspector report, understand what's inspected, and understand understand what's not inspected. So why JP home inspection? So I'm a graduate of Inspection 21, one of the Jersey's uh, number one home inspection schools. Uh, I really believe and I truly believe that one-on-one -on -one with the client is best, especially when it's one of your biggest investments you're going to make. Um, I am a member of, a member of New Jersey, NACI, and InterNACI, and that's where I get all my continuing education. Uh, I try to stay on top of all of the, the new features you know, that, are, uh, that are being out there. Um, I use professional grade inspection tools. Um, this camera and this moisture meter are examples of them. Um, I also have a drone. Now, as cool as the drone is, I try to walk every single roof I possibly can. So I rarely use that. I only use that drone on roofs that I cannot get on or cannot safely get on. So, um, but I still have a backup. And let's say the weather's bad. You know, we can't fly those, you know, in bad weather. So I actually do have a camera pole that can um, extend and I have a camera attachment to it. And I can get pictures that way as well. Um, and you get in cross spaces. And I get in cross spaces that are about that high. <laughs> so, uh, again, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I am not afraid to get, you know, into tight spaces. Um, you know, technically, if I'm in an attic and there's not safe flooring, a home inspector doesn't have to go into it. I at least make the attempt to try to walk those ceiling joists to, to, you know, to get a visual. Like I said, you know, I, I try to provide the most honest, complete, and thorough inspection in the industry. Um, I truly take my time with it, um, and I, and like I said, I bring you guys along with me. I encourage you to ask questions, um, and I don't rush it. You know, I don't. I'm not one of those inspectors that books three in a day and has to get out of the house at a certain time. I try to do one a day if possible. And if I need, if I really need to, I can do two, but I will you know, um, schedule them far enough where I'm not feeling rushed because there's just no way that I can tell you that I'm gonna be done in two hours. There's just no way. You know, There are issues that none of us will know of until the day of inspection. And we don't know how long that's gonna take to inspect. So, um, and also competitive pricing. Um, even though I, I include this thermal imaging inspection with every single inspection, um, that doesn't really up my cost. My cost is very competitive, and um, you know it's really based on square footage. So every house is going to be a little different, but um, you know we provide free quotes 